Okay, today we're going to talk about shoulder rehab. I've been uh, asked by lots and lots of people, quite a, quite a few just recently, about uh, our version of shoulder rehab, and I uh, thought we'd make a, a quick video to detail some of the uh, the essences of the process, uh, give you a little anatomical background, and, and tell you about the procedure that we've developed that's worked several times in rehabbing the shoulder that involves um, the starting strength approach to things, that is uh, basic compound movements over isolation. So uh, what, we'll, what we will talk about is first some, some basic anatomy and do an explanation of the basic anatomy and then we'll talk specifically about the actual process that uh, we have developed over the past five or six years, first with my shoulder operations and then with those of several people that we've helped with this. And uh, maybe distill, distill for you a, uh, an active approach that you can take a little earlier in the process uh, than perhaps your physical therapist or your orthopedic surgeon wants you to do. Since this will be going against medical advice, I'm just going to advise you right now that this is the procedure that I used and that you take this upon yourself at your own risk. I think you'll see though that it works very well. So let's start off with the discussion of the shoulder anatomy so we can see exactly what we'll be dealing with. This is a figure from our book, Starting Strength Basic Barbell Training. All of these illustrations I'm going to show you are from our very fine illustrator, Jason Kelly. And what we're looking at here is the, the shoulder anatomy, the superficial and the deep shoulder anatomy, uh, shown from the posterior. Uh, I want to draw your attention first to the big musculature that connects the humerus to the base, uh, to the axial skeleton here. And what you'll see is that the arm hangs from the scapula. The humerus hangs from the scapula and you can see the outlines of those two bones embedded under the outlines of the muscles that are on top of them. The, uh, the basics of the anatomy are that the humerus, the head of the humerus, is a ball and the glenoid fossa of the scapula makes a very poorly developed socket that the humerus rides in. And uh, it's not a very robust ball and socket joint like the acetabulum and head of the femur of the hip. It uh, swaps uh, stability for range of motion. Uh, the shoulder joint is a much more flexible joint than the, than the hip. It's got a much bigger range of motion. And as a result of that, the cup that the head of the humerus rides in is rather shallow. The stability of the shoulder is provided by lots and lots of muscles that cross between the scapula and Prior to that, the uh, basic musculature of the uh, upper back, the spine, and the humerus. Uh, a lot of this is drawn right here. You can see that the trapezius, the big muscle lying adjacent to the spine, attaches to the scapula and holds up the scapula. In fact, when you hold a press overhead, as is illustrated in this position, what you see is that the trapezius is what's actually responsible for holding up the load overhead. Uh, the deltoids go across from the scapula and the clavicle and attach to the humerus about a third of the way down, also crossing that joint from the posterior view that you can see here is the triceps. Now, there's another view. This thing right here is an anterior view of the same structure. You'll notice here on the right hand side of your screen that you are looking at the clavicle, the anterior side of the clavicle, the muscle holding the head of the humerus in the glenoid from the anterior side is called the subscapularis. And you'll also see that the bicep, 
comes from positions on the scapula and goes down uh, past the elbow, elbow joint, also supporting the arm from the shoulder. You'll notice on the left-hand side of the illustration that the pec also, the great big muscle in the front, as well as the deltoids, and you can see their anterior expression there, they cross over and attach onto the humerus as well. All of this muscle mass supports the head of the humerus. The muscle mass in question, though, is the rotator cuff muscle. Now, the rotator cuff muscle is pictured on the right hand, the left hand side, I'm sorry, of this, of this illustration, is uh, uh, composed of three muscle slips. These are rather small muscles. They are the supraspinatus, this one on top, the infraspinatus is underneath the spine of the scapula, and the teres minor also attaches between the scapula and the humerus. If you work these muscles in isolation, like you can do in the physical therapist's office with a two pound chrome dumbbell or a therapy band, a big rubber band, then you can freeze the shoulder like I have done here in internal rotation and load the external rotation. This would be an example of external rotation as would this. This external rotation can be facilitated with very, very light resistance, once again, in the physical therapist's office. But you'll notice that both of those movements are unfamiliar. That's because you never do them outside of the physical therapist's office. And the reason for that is they are not natural human movements. These things are called the rotator cuff. And as a result of them being called the rotator cuff, everyone has the impression that that's their primary function. Nothing could be further from the truth. Look at this drawing. This pictures the origin and insertion of all three of these posterior rotator cuff muscles. You'll notice that they all arise along the scapula and they all insert on the head of the humerus. The function of these muscles happens to be external rotation if they're used in isolation, but they're normal, functional, to quote a term, it's highly overused, their, their functional uh, purpose in your shoulder is to the add, is to add to the sucking down of the head of the humerus into the glenoid joint, as pictured by this arrow. Now, if you are pressing a barbell up overhead, then gravity is also jamming the head of the humerus down into the glenoid socket of the scapula. And in, a, in an overhead position, you'll notice that the humerus is headed in a relatively vertical direction and that the spine of the scapula over here is completely out of the way. One of the primary things that we hear from people who don't understand barbell training is that impingement will take place if you press overhead. Impingement in this position, as we've illustrated right here, is quite a possibility. Lots and lots of people have hurt themselves on the rings by allowing one arm or both arms in some situations to drift away from the midline of the body, thus pinching the insertions of these muscle bellies between the head of the humerus and the spine of the scapula. It's quite nicely illustrated in this, in this view right here. Now compare this position with what you see here. This is the position in the overhead press as is here. Note that as you press the barbell up and as you finish the press with the correct shrug of the trapezius, the trapezius here pulls the spine of the scapula medial and superior, thus producing room in between the head of the humerus and the spine of the scapula. In other words, in the correct press, the lockout position of the correct press, it is anatomically impossible to impinge the, so the shoulder. It is anatomically impossible for the press 
to do what everyone in the medical community seems to object to about the press. Why they don't understand this, I don't know. That's not my job to teach them. I'll teach them if they pay me, but I'm not, you know, we, we published our book. We, we've shown you this several times. This position is the normal finish of the press, and in a normal, correctly performed press, impingement is impossible. But more important than that, look at the function of the rotator cuff muscles on the posterior here. As they contract, as this muscle belly gets shorter, what does it do? It adds to the stability of the head of the humerus in the socket of the glenoid, which is the normal function of these muscle groups in a normally functioning shoulder. Now, let's also observe what's happening here. Do you see all of these muscles across between the back, the scapula, and the humerus? The little muscle slips of the rotator cuff are far from the only thing supporting the head of the humerus in the glenoid. Far from the only thing. Look at this view again. You see the trapezius holding up the scapula and the clavicle from the anterior. Do you see the deltoids as they cross from the shoulder down to the humerus? Do you see the pec as it crosses from the, from the sternum to the humerus? The subscapularis in front of the clavicle also crosses from the scapula to the humerus. The bicep supports it all the way down to the elbow joint. Note here, the triceps which cross from the humerus up to the scapula in, in three different places, two different places they cross the shoulder joint. All of this muscle mass, in addition to the fact that the scapula is supported from the spine all the way from the base of the skull down to T12, by the trapezius, this big muscle belly along the line of the spine. The shoulder is supported by a lot more muscle mass than just the small muscles of the rotator cuff. Now, if this rotator cuff is damaged, usually by doing something stupid like this activity on the right, if the shoulder cuff is, the cuff muscles are damaged right in here and are impinged, a hole can be torn in this tendon complex right under the bone of the acromion process, which is the distal end of the spine of the scapula. Sometimes, depending on the type of life you've led and the activities that you've pursued, a bone spur can form on the inferior aspect of this bone out here the uh, acromion process. And a bone spur pointing down is an excellent little tool to use to dig a hole into that tendon. This happens quite frequently. And a tendon injury right in here is a big giant problem because of the fact that it cannot heal normally. This tendon cannot heal because the muscles that operate that tendon remain under tension and the tension on that tendon injury pulls it open. It can't knit back together if it's pulled open. It must therefore be repaired with surgery. This surgery is painful. It's also potentially delicate depending on how it is done. I had this performed on my right shoulder right here. And uh, it's rather debilitating due to the high level of pain that uh, the surgery produces. Any time you go into the shoulder capsule, you're gonna have a lot of pain. I was not prepared for the amount of pain I was in for three or four weeks after the surgery. It finally dies down, but I'll tell you that I did not sleep more than 10 minutes at a time for three weeks after the surgery because of the fact that it is, is so painful and conventional opiate painkillers don't work on me. I didn't have any, any way to kill the pain. It was rather 
it was rather painful. But the surgery had to be done. If that tendon, that hole in that tendon is not repaired, the shoulder joint will degenerate to the point where you'll have to have the joint replaced eventually. It produces bony arthritis and lots and lots of problems. And that way you can't sleep for the rest of your life. So I took the three weeks of no sleep after the shoulder tendon repair in lieu of being crippled. So I had this done. This is several years ago. And post-op, the orthopedic surgeon who has become a friend of mine, the guy's a real, real good guy, he's a good surgeon, he, uh, Dr. O'Neill, Anil Coganti in Dallas, those of you that want to avail yourself of his services, he's a very talented guy, very nice guy. He told me that uh, he would recommend after the surgery that I remain completely immobile for six weeks, six weeks in a sling, no mobility. This, of course, uh, was disturbing to a person of my temperament. Possibly it's disturbing to you as well. Once again, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm telling you what I did. And one of the interesting things that we found out during the course of this rehab was that uh, quite soon after the surgery, I could deadlift. Uh, started off with rack pulls at 185 pounds, 225. Uh, three and a half weeks post-op, I was deadlifting 315 off the floor. 315 pounds off the floor on a three and a half week old shoulder operation produced absolutely no pain whatsoever. And it gave me an opportunity to actually move the shoulder around. Now, this kind of demands an explanation, doesn't it? Why would it not hurt? What you're, what you're really dealing with here is a very small injury that is being spotted by a huge amount of other uninjured muscle in the vicinity of the shoulder. What we found was the deadlift did not hurt at all. Now, I didn't go max out or do anything stupid like that, but 315 for a set of 10 produced absolutely no pain in the shoulder three and a half weeks post-op. This is a fascinating development. It allowed me to move the shoulder without hurting anything and start the process of rehabbing the shoulder joint far ahead of the surgeon's recommendation. Now with that in mind, we proceeded to the next part of the shoulder rehab where I actually used the press and the chin up as the active part of rehabbing directly the injured part of the shoulder. And this is what we did. Here's my arm, my injured right arm. It's in a sling. I can't move it very much. It doesn't have a nice range of motion yet, especially not under the, the movement, uh, under the control of the muscle mass that I'm trying to heal up. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my good arm and I'm gonna place it right there on top of the stick. I'm going to grip the stick with a normal press grip and then I'm going to lock my elbows out using my triceps. And then I'm going to do an amazing thing. I'm going to walk forward. I'm going to come back down. And if this is the first day of rehab, this range of motion will be a challenge. So what I'll do is a set of 10 gradually increasing the range of motion with each rep until finally on rep number 10, here I am. Get a full stretch up at the top. And the first day's workout might consist of nothing more than walking the stick up the arc that's created by the rings hanging from the ceiling and working the range of motion. So that might that three or four or five sets of those might constitute the first day's work. Now, it's day two. Here I am again. This would probably be two days later. I help my bad arm back up on the stick. I lock my triceps out. And then I walk up. And the first set of 10 would be range of motion work. Once again, just walking forward and letting the rings arc the stick up into this range of motion. And then, 
Second set, I'll begin to actually work on the press by unlocking and relocking my elbows. And what this is going to do is allow me to very carefully, under the protection of the rings, because all of the load is hanging on the rings in front of me, work the range of motion that's injured. Partial range of motion work, right at the top. Having gotten up into the top, where it really doesn't hurt, with the help of these rings. The top is going to be relatively protected by the trapezius, the deltoids and the triceps, as they lock the shoulder out. The problems with the range of motion after a shoulder operation of this nature will be at the bottom, the start position of the press. We'll get there eventually, but right now, we're going to work through the range of motion with a very light load. The stick hanging from the rings, not really any load at all. And the variable is going to be the range of motion. Until I can get this thing back down to what will eventually look pretty much like a full range of motion press. After about the fourth workout, I can modify it again. I'll walk up until I'm in the full range of motion, and then I will lock my traps and my triceps, and I will step back so that the stick is off of the rings completely. And then I will begin to control the range of motion without the rings, working that gradually down until I am once again at full range of motion with essentially no weight. Lowering and raising the bar into position using the rings to protect the shoulder during the transition into that top position. And then we go up in weight. This bar weighs 15 pounds. I would start with the stick on the first set the day I started using this load, and then I'd once again resume the full range of motion presses that I had started with the empty stick, working 15 pounds down to a full range of motion. And I'm using sets of 10 on this work. Don't want anything heavy like a set of five, I want sets of 10. Once again, using the rings to raise and lower the bar. And then we go up and weight again. This is a 45 pound bar. The day I use the 45, 45 pound bar, I will have warmed up with the stick and the 15 pound bar. First day I use the 45 pounds, I'll walk this up and this will be heavier, and, but I'll have about two weeks worth of work on this at the time. And once again, partial range of motion, extending the range of motion down, walking back off of the rings so that I'm controlling the load and not the rings. I finish the set at the top and again, lower it under the protection of the rings so that the rings are protecting the range of motion all the way up and all the way down. And all I have to do is press the bar, having warmed it up very thoroughly. During this process, pain must be your guide. You have to be able to differentiate between the normal pain of rehabilitation. It hurts to rehab. The normal pain of forcing repaired tissue to get better and abnormal pain that would be caused by you going too fast, too hard, over too long a range of motion too quickly, and thereby endangering the repair. If you're not willing to push into the pain, you're not going to get any better. But if you fail to use good judgment, you could very easily re-injure this, and that is not something that you want to do. So this is the first phase of the press rehab. Here's the second phase. What we did with this is set the bar in the power rack at the top 
so that I could start at the top of the range of motion of the press, walk it out, do a set, and then rack it at the top. Once again, the most painful part of the range of motion of a repaired shoulder is the bottom, the start position. And in my experience, the thing remains painful for months after the surgery, many months after the surgery. It was quite a while before I could get back to doing the press from normal start position at the, at the bottom down here where we teach the press position. From the top, it was relatively painless because I used the stretch reflex into the bottom. And uh, that cushioning seemed to keep uh, the repaired structures from clicking into the wrong place. That's kind of the sensation you get when you, when you, when you explore that little possibility. So what we did was we started at the top. And the, the excellent thing about this wonderful rack that our friend Johnny Brown builds is that you can set these pins to allow you to take the thing out of the rack and safely rack it in this position. So locking the bar out, you do the set, walk in and replace it. Once you're in, in a position to do the press from the top down, you're pretty much on the way to being healed. At this point, we can start loading the bar with our plates and run it up relatively normally. And what you'll find is that you will be back pretty close to your work sets of five with the bar starting at the top, going from the top down. This won't take very long. So that's kind of the, the, the summary of the press phase of this, uh, of this method. The rest of the rehab consisted of lat pull downs and chins. Now, I found that I was able to get back to doing chins very quickly with just a little bit of lat machine warm up. In fact, I did chins the first day back that I tried to do them and that probably took place at about five weeks post-op. Uh, at any rate, when I went back for my seven week checkup, I had essentially full range of, mo range of motion in the shoulder. The uh, reps were high, the weight was light, and that should be the guideline for rehabbing any injury. But the primary thing to keep in mind is that the weights, the range of motion, the volume, some aspect of the work must go up. The trend must be upward because the trend is what produces the adaptation. And what you'll find is you will be healthier faster with less pain if you do it this way. Now, once again, I'm not recommending that this is what you do. I'm just telling you what I did. Your mileage may vary. A lot of it will depend on how strong you were prior to the surgery. And if you've never done a chin before, five weeks post-op from a shoulder cuff repair is probably the wrong time to try to start doing chins. But lat pulls are accessible to most everybody. Now remember, in addition to these two exercises, these various versions of the press and the lat pull down and later the chin, we're doing, we're doing pulls. Uh, we're doing the pulls, in fact, before we start the active work on the rings and the chin ups because the pulls, rack pulls, deadlifts, can begin fairly quickly after the surgery uh, because they do not stress the repair at all. And what you'll find is, is they will make you feel better. They'll give your body kind of a kickstart because just laying around on your ass after surgery is not a good recipe for producing the, the growth factors that, that heal things up. They get you back at the blood pumping, get your mental attitude better about everything and give you an active way to start participating in your own healing process. Now, remember, this is just what I did. I'm not advising you to do that. I can't do that. But I'm just telling you that this thing worked pretty well for me. And it's worked very well for the people that we have had in the gym that have had this type of surgery and the people that we've consulted with across the country and across the world. It's worked pretty well for them. So if you are willing to take responsibility, willing to go against medical advice and take responsibility for your own 
rehab, this is something that you might want to try. And uh, all I can tell you is, is good luck with your shoulder surgery. It's going to be painful. Don't have any, any uh, misconceptions about your ability to manage the pain. Uh, it will be painful, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. Those of you guys are sitting there uh, cursing the day you hurt your shoulder. It gets better. It really does. You'll be back to good as new. If your surgeon is competent, you'll be back to as good as new before you think you will. It'll take uh, several months for the pain to completely go away, but you'll be back to lifting the same weight you were before. Just take care of it. Don't do anything stupid. But by the same token, remember, you make things heal. You don't let them heal. Thanks for watching.